What the, the Marxists latched on to here was race. They, they latched on to the original sin in America. Intersectionality, yeah. Yep. Uh, they realized that the class warfare wasn't working, but they could turn society on its head in other ways, white versus black. Yep. And Fascist means to a Marxist end, and they know that incrementally over time, if they can do that bit by bit by bit by bit, we're going to be in a radically transformed country that we, we can't restore back to where it was, which was Obama's whole goal. I remember when when there was this negotiated, you know, uh, treaty with Iran during the uh, Obama years. It was it was interesting to see this Iranian whose name has gone straight out of my head. He's a fascinating guy. I wrote wrote for the New York Post. I don't know if he still does, but he was explaining how Farsi works. That it's a deliberately uh, aspects of the language are very um, ambiguous. And he said, you know, if you watch what the Obama administration was saying that the treaty said, they would say um, the uh, the, uh, Iranians agree not to make nuclear weapons. He says, I'm listening to it in Farsi, where their press spokesman says, we will make nuclear weapons. Obama administration says they agree not to do this. They said, no, we will do this. It's it's absolutely fascinating, but you're absolutely absolutely right about that, the obsession with, with Iran and to elevate Iran, and even through this administration that we see we see right here. Obviously, the goal is to, to support what you're saying. The goal is it used to be to try to raise other countries to the level of the United States. Now the goal is to bring America down to third world status as a, almost an act of, well, not almost, as an act of revenge. We're going to make you pay. And it's why this government hates Americans. I I never felt with the Clinton administration, they hated Americans. I I hated the Clinton administration, but I didn't feel that there was emanating from them a hatred for, you know, the whole of the American people, even if there was towards, you know, certain aspects of the American people. You absolutely feel that this is going on here. Recently, I want to talk about the press for just a second. You're, you're You're a big part of that. I was reading uh, Frederick Forsyth, you know, the novelist, you know, the... He's, he's my favorite spy novelist of all time. I'm with you on that. Um, he's fantastic. He's, he's fabulous. And I was, I've read The Day of the Jackal multiple times, the Odessa File, The Fourth Protocol. And there's quite a story about The Fourth Protocol, I have to tell you, um, off camera. But anyway, I decided to read his, uh, and I think it was published in 2014, four size, uh, he, he would dispute that it's, a, it's a, an autobiography, so we'll say a memoir, his personal memoir. And he, I didn't know this, he started his career with Reuters and then went from Reuters to BBC. So he was with BBC for quite a while. And what comes through is his abject hatred for BBC. And he said it came when during the, uh, the late 60s and early 70s, he was covering the Nigerian Civil War. And he says, I'm seeing genocide. And he said, but the official policy of BBC, which is a state-run you know, run news agency, so it's like, it's like TASS, it's like Pravda or something, was that there's no civil war. There's no genocide. And um, he said, so I report that some of these things are, are happening. I'm reporting the... the state-sponsored famine that is taking place there. And he says, I'm fired because I'm told you're not allowed to say this. You cannot say that this is what's happening. It isn't happening, or that's the official line. And then he said this, this is what I thought was very quotable. He says it twice in the book. He says, the purpose of the press, the purpose of media, the purpose of a journalist is to hold power to account not to become part of it. Now, you're endeavoring to hold power to account, Sean. I I follow what you do. I read your stuff. Uh, You're endeavoring to do that. What has happened in the media world? I mean, there's always been an element of media that wants to. I mean, listen, we go back to Walter Duranty, you know, uh, who won a a, a Pulitzer Prize with the New York Times uh, reporting that there was no famine in Ukraine, you know, during the, uh, the 1930s. So there's always been that element. But then there were Malcolm Muggeridge's, you know, who were saying, nope. Famine is happening. This did occur. What has happened where it feels like there's nobody in traditional legacy media 
who isn't a part of the problem now, who isn't corrupt, who isn't a part of the regime. First off, I love that you love Frederick Forsyth. I literally just read The Devil's Alternative, oh. it, his fourth book. He's fantastic. I, I think The Day of the Jackal is the most perfect. I want to meet him. I want to oh. meet him. He's still alive. He's in his late 80s, but I'd love to meet Maybe together we yes, can, we can, go, we can do go, a, go and have coffee with him. We, we can do, go do a, a fanboy uh, pilgrimage. I, I will say this very quickly on Fourth Protocol so people don't think it's something conspiratorial. I tweeted a thread about this about a year or so ago, and we'll, we'll come back to, to my question for you, but you'll love this, that you love Forsyth. I read the book, The Fourth Protocol. We were talking about our ranches and such, and so I'm on my tractor, and I decided to listen to it. And when I listened to it, there is in, in, in entire sections that were not in the book. And it's about how Marxists topple a regime. Now, this is a book written in the, in the 80s. So I go back to the book and I'm listening to the audio section, like, you know, roughly where is that? I'm going through the book. No, they're not there. So I look to see that this is the first American edition. So then I order a British edition of the book, not there. And then I go back to the original printing of the book and I discover it. But from all American and Canadian printings, it has been removed. Wow which I thought really weird. And then I ordered, because the film is not available on Netflix, it's not available on Amazon, so I ordered the DVD to watch it, and, and there's none of that type of stuff in, uh, in the film, and it's an okay film with Pierce Brosnan and Michael Caine. But I was fascinated that here I am on my tractor listening to this, and I'm, I'm starting to sit up, and this was right during you know the all the BLM riots, and I was like, Forsyth has, like a prophet, told us that this is the way they topple regimes. They penetrate the, the um, instruments of popular coercion, yeah. the military and the police. They purge them of all conservative elements because those are naturally conservative entities. And then they radicalize them by replacing them with those who are ready to make war on a domestic population. And I thought, holy smokes. I want to meet Frederick Forsyth. Oh, yeah. I want to have a conversation. Does he know that these sections have been removed from all American editions of the book? But I've changed the subject, but I have I'll, to tell you that because oh, no, it's fascinating. I'll, I'll bring it right back around. So, so Dogs of War that he wrote, I love. It's, it's about a, a mining concern that, that gets its eyes on concessions in uh, Central Africa. Also and, about toppling a regime yeah, absolutely. with a small force. And one of the first things they do in this book, and, and it's, I know it's fiction, but it, it, it holds true. When you're going to go topple a regime, the first thing you do is you take over the radio station. It's the first thing you do. Because at that point, you control information. It's what, it's what the Nazis did when they invaded Poland. Yep. And so you ask, how did we get to oppress? It's what they did when they invaded Norway. Yep. That's what they all do. Yep. You, want to, you want to control what people are hearing and thinking so you can control what they believe. What happened with our press, who very much do that to this day on, on behalf of the regime, how did we go from this, um, this sense that their job was to uh, hold the powerful accountable to kind of like this regime bootlicker role? <laughs> I, I think Watergate. I think Watergate permanently corrupted the American press because you had a bunch of you That's know interesting. people who would be called ink-stained wretches. Being a journalist was never supposed to be a glamorous job. I mean, you worked a beat. There were awful hours. Everyone hated you. And do you characterize yourself as a journalist or as a writer? I would never call myself a journalist, <laughs> ever. We share that because yeah. sometimes people will say, you're a journalist. I'm like, no, I was trained as an academic. I'm a writer. I'm an entrepreneur I've, and a I've writer. Higher, I have higher standards than, than, and this is not a shot at every journalist. There are some great conservative journalists out there who I have immense respect for. But very few anymore, and they they seem to have very little education, uh, very little understanding of what's going on, and uh, and their standards are you know just clickbait. Anyway, yeah, I would continue. never call someone I respect the J word. Uh, so what happened was you have you have Watergate, where they suddenly went from a pretty difficult job. It didn't pay well. Everyone hated you because you're constantly making enemies based on what you wrote. To seeing these two guys become celebrities. They suddenly Woodward went, and Bernstein. Yep, where, where Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford. Exactly. Yeah. Although wo poor Carl Bernstein, <laughs> Woodward is clearly the entire brain to that operation. <laughs> but you, these guys became stars. They became millionaires. They're feted by everyone. They get to go to these big galas, and journalists suddenly saw this opportunity. Hey, instead of being a commentator on the sidelines, 
I get to be a main character. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I get am to be the on. News. I get to be on that stage. Dan Rather, absolutely. And it it that belief has infected, especially the Washington press corps. Now, I don't think this applies to beat journalists who are working in local papers around there. This is very much a uh, a creature of the swamp in Washington. But they they no longer believe their job is to just report facts or tell the truth. Their job is to shape the news. There, there was a no. great, uh, not great, but hilarious New York Times commercial that ran 10 or 15 years ago. It, it was a digital ad trying to convince people to buy into the New York Times. And they said, it's not just what we report. It's how we shape the news. Yeah. yeah and this, this haughty tone yes. with the snifter of brand new. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did this attitude like, no, that's not your job. Yeah. Your job is just to say what happened. And then you let us figure out what the implications of that are. But you see it in what happens in the White House press briefing room, especially well, when there's a Republican president. Yeah, for sure. And, and where I've really noticed it, and it's just because I kind of pay attention specifically to this, are the presidential debates. I was, oh. I was kind of proud of the fact that this morning you had mentioned a debate with Peter Singer that you had seen, and you didn't even know that I moderated it, <laughs> and the debate that you had seen. And why I say I'm proud of that is because my view as a moderator is that I am not to be a third personality on stage. A good football game is when you don't remember the referees. Amen. Um, that's a good football game. And so I always saw my my role in these high-level academic debates at Oxford and Princeton and Australia and elsewhere, um, that my job was to keep them on schedule, to make sure they do not violate the rules, occasionally to represent the audience with some of the questions that I'm asking, but to not debate the subjects with them. Even if they say something I think is particularly outrageous, it's this guy's job to refute what he's saying. Not my job to do that. I'm not supposed to be a, a participant in that. It's very funny because one of the debates we did in Birmingham, um, here in Birmingham, Alabama, that was covered by 60 Minutes and C-SPAN, is Christopher Hitchens was going very frustrated with the guy that he was debating, David Berlinski. So he turned to me and said something to the effect of, Larry, I mean, why don't you say that we... Uh... So he was trying to debate me in that. And I was like, look, you're not going to pull me into this. I know you're trying to pull me into that. A month later, we did debate each other. But I wasn't the moderator on that occasion. And when I watch these presidential debates... I'm so frustrated that they can't, they see, they see it as an opportunity for brand building and a little bit like this judge in the Trump trial. This is my chance to show what a big shot I am that I can say to the president of the United States, you know, no commentary from you. And yeah, I, I find that so pompous, so infuriating. And it supports exactly what you're saying about what has happened. I hadn't thought of it quite like that. Go, taking, taking it back to Watergate and Woodward and Bernstein is an interesting place to begin because I tend to think of it as a more recent phenomenon, but I think you're right. You know, and it, it's, there's so many parallels now between what's happening, whether it was the Russia collusion hoax or the Kavanaugh hoax or the Ukraine hoax, all of it. You look back at Watergate and the story that the press wants you to think is, if not for them, this corrupt president would have gotten away with it. He was using the powers of the presidency to go and rob people and try to, to steal the election by hook or crook. The real story of Watergate is you had a Fed at the FBI, Mark Felt, who was pissed off that he didn't get the job he wanted to do. And by hook or crook, he was going to make sure Nixon paid for it. Yeah, working that's, their own angles. That, that was all that happened. Now, I'm not saying that the Watergate break-in itself was a good thing. Clearly, it wasn't. But, but the Watergate break-in is a big bunch of nothing compared, yeah, exactly. to, what we're, compared to what we're seeing now. Absolutely. Compared Watergate to what was a walk in the park. It, it, I mean, the Nord Stream pipeline alone... Uh, Biden blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline, for those who um, who don't know what I'm talking about, that alone, it's an act of war, is a hundred times bigger and more corrupt than what took place in Watergate. Right. So, so what you had in Watergate was uh, uh, functionally in form the exact same thing that happened during the Russia collusion hoax. You had a bunch of people at the top of the FBI who had personal grudges. They had political uh, vendettas they wanted to settle, and they manipulated the press uh, into doing their bidding. It's the exact same thing. And you know what? All the people who were involved in the Russia collusion hoax, even though they were peddling obvious lies that if, if you, anyone with a brain knew it was nonsense, 
they all got Pulitzers. They all got book deals. Jim Comey, the, 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 probably the most corrupt head of the FBI since J. Edgar Hoover. That guy goes out and gets, what, a five or six million dollar book advance? what a narcissist. Advance? Oh my what gosh. a narcissist this that, guy is. That guy. I mean, it, we hear lots and lots about how the FBI, it's a great organization. The rank and file are awesome. The entire agency was conceived in nonsense. The, the guy who, whose name is still on the building that they work in, J. Edgar Hoover, made his bones spying on people in government who he didn't like and then blackmailing them based on the file he had. So no, I'm sorry, the, the, the entire uh, institution of the FBI was conceived in lies and deceit. And so I, I, I have no patience for people who want to argue that, oh, it's just a couple of bad apples. No, no, it, it, it's, a, it's a rotten orchard is what it is. But y- you, you go back to why we have a press that doesn't care about anything uh, related to reporting the news. They're all a bunch of left-wing Democrats, and they all want to be famous. Look at Jim Acosta at CNN. An absolute joke of a guy who has not, he's never done any real reporting or any real journalism in his life. He just shows up and peacocks for the camera so he can get a book deal. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, uh, April Ryan going up there. Uh, she's, she has, I think, uh, Valerie Jarrett and a bunch of Obama people at her wedding. You had Candy Crowley in the debate with Romney in 2012, where she decided she was going to be a participant in that debate. Uh, imagine if you're watching a boxing match and halfway through the ref kicks one of the guys in the balls and then peacocks all around him about what a great referee he is. Oh, Caitlin Collins. Caitlin, um, Caitlin Collins. Caitlin Collins, who I'm, I'm sorry to say is a graduate of the University of Alabama, <laughs> but how, how embarrassing and how pompous has she been in her role as moderator or interviewer? I mean, it's... It's really quite astonishing what we're seeing from from a day when you, no one's asking for members of the press to not have their own opinions. That's 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 ridiculous to not think that, um, or rather to think that they're asking them to show some measure of objectivity and some level of fairness in the way they adjudicate these things. And they're, they're now participants. They are now partisans in exactly everything that's going on. Everyone's gonna encounter pain in their life. The questions deal with the degree of one's pain and the source of one's pain and how we deal with our pain. In this course, I'm speaking very personally about my own pain and some of the lessons that I've learned in coping with pain, how we minister to people with pain, and what kind of perspective are we to have on the big questions that surround pain and human suffering. Why would you take a course like this? Well, presumably, if you haven't suffered in your own life, you will encounter people who do, and undoubtedly some of them are people who are very near and dear to you. I think it'd be very helpful for you to take a course like this in order to understand what they're experiencing and the way that you minister to people in those kinds of circumstances. So I'd love for you to take this course of mine, and I wanna tell you this, that when you subscribe to Tome, you get access not just to my course, but to more than a hundred other courses that are dealing with very practical issues and assisting you in living and in flourishing. So where can you get this course? Well, you can't get it at Amazon. You can't get it at Apple. You can't get it at Netflix. You can only get it at Tome. So I want you to go to tomeapp.com slash pain to learn more about my course. Let's get back to the podcast. Question for you, and I very definitely have an opinion about this, but it's sort of a running debate that I have with some of my academic friends. And that is, do you think that what we're seeing uh, taking place, and I think I'm going to do a show on this, is, is, is a creeping Marxism, or do you think it's fascism? I think it's both. I don't, I don't see why it can't be both. Yeah. So actual fascism which nobody who throws the word around anymore seems to know what it actually yes. means it just means you're a it means i don't like you so you must be a nazi and the nazis were fascist therefore you're a fascist no fascism is the total melding of government and corporate power for political ends that it's superb well done. Thank you. Great definition. You look at what's happening, we'll, we'll say with big tech, because we've talked about censorship. You have a bunch of big tech monopolies or maybe oligopolies working on behalf of the government that's giving them a whole bunch of different benefits um, and working towards their political ends. 
that's fascism. Yes. You, you have a bunch of corporations getting into the BLM race DEI game on behalf of the government. That's fascism. So that that to me, fascism is generally a I use it as a value neutral term. It, it it's a it, it's the mere melding of corporate and government power to whatever ends. Unfortunately, the ends they're pushing are Marxist ends. Yes. So you you would be tempted to think, well, the communists were Marxists and the fascists were their enemies. So obviously, you can't have them be the same thing. No, we're seeing fascist means to a Marxist end, and the difference in America, I think. Uh, compared to the Soviet Union, where class was used as the the ultimate delineator, they they wanted to help the the lower classes rise up and take over. That didn't really work well in America because America has never been a permanently stratified class based system. You can be born poor and die rich. You can be born rich and die poor. We have a lot of mobility. What the the Marxists latched onto here was race. They, they latched on to the original sin in America. Intersectionality, yeah. Yep. Uh, they realized they couldn't set um, rich, rich against poor. Um, that the class warfare wasn't working, but they could turn society on its head in other ways, white versus black yep. and, you know, um, heterosexual. Marxism. Yes, exactly. Yep. Uh, continue. Yep. So so that's what they're exploiting now, especially with the race this thing. This Gramsci. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they're exploiting that and using it to create division and bitterness and violence and anger and then hoping hoping that with that agitation and propaganda, which is the root of agitprop, by the way, which is a key part of Soviet active measures when they would come in and infiltrate institutions, they're hoping that they can use that agitation and that anger um, to destabilize things, at which point they come in and radically change things in the midst of that chaos in a way that you can't easily ratchet backwards to where it was before. It's a one-way ratchet. It moves in this direction, and good luck getting it back. And they know that incrementally over time, if they can do that bit by bit by bit by bit, we're going to be in a radically transformed country that we we can't restore back to where it was, which was Obama's whole goal. You know, I uh, I really commend you and your in your defining of terms because I find that most people they they throw around these terms they don't really understand what they mean. And while all all Nazis were fascists, not all fascists are Nazis. Absolutely. I mean, Nazism is by definition anti-Semitic. And I maintain that the World Economic Forum, they're fascists. Um, this is you know, a, a traditional, at least until modern times, where they've kind of gradually changed the definition of fascism to look like a, uh, a red stater wearing a, you know, make America great again, <laughs> you know, a hat. Uh, a traditional definition was, you know, basically a strict regimentation of the economy for war. So a melding, just as you say, of corporate power with government power. You know, fascists aren't, cash, fascists are, um, uh, they believe in private property. They just believe it should be controlled by the state. And ESG is fascism. Absolutely. I mean, it's 100% fascism. And when I was in China, some before I was banned from China, when I was in China in 2010, you know, I get there and I see, you know, Gucci and I see Ferrari and I see, um, you know, Gap and this kind of stuff. And I concluded this country isn't communist, it is fascist because they realized that Marxist-Leninist economics they don't work. Mm -hmm. And so what we were seeing, and you know, way back when I was in graduate school, and I'm, I'm studying Russian history, I'm studying European history, studying Marxism, socialism, fascism. No one spoke of fascism as the logical outcome of a Marxist state because no one had seen it. But now we have, and it seems to me that what has happened is that the only places that anybody thinks Marxism can work are places like Paris and London and DC and you know Portland. You know they they think it can happen there, but the traditionally Marxist states have long since Vietnam, China, Russia. I've spent a fair amount of time in all of them. They all realized the only way to keep up with the West, we're going to be throwing rocks in the street, you know, while, you know, Reagan is, you know, is building a Star Wars, you know, system, 
is to adopt their tactics. So as the Chinese put it, what, what do they call it? Capitalism with Chinese characteristics, which is fascism, right. is basically we're going to allow a limited amount of capitalism, provided that we control it, for the sake of generating the money that we need to maintain power. But we're going to keep Marxism, uh, at least its controls, at a lower level. And that's what's happened in each of those countries. Yep. They've all abandoned Marxism, and then they have become fascist states, but they are strictly regimenting the economy for war. War against whom? Against domestic populations. And to add to this, I was in Cuba uh, last year, I think it was, and uh, Cuba hasn't made this jump yet. Not at all. They're still Marxist. Uh, in every respect, they're Marxist. You don't see Gap. You don't see Ferrari. You don't. You don't. You don't see. You know any of these. Um, you know e e extraordinary things that you see in some. I mean, Shanghai makes any city in the West look it's third marble. world. Yep. It looks. I mean, you get outside of there, and it is China is third world. But Shanghai is an astonishingly modern city. But it is because they have no respect for civil liberties whatsoever. So I'm I'm in my hotel, and I'm looking down as they are annihilating a city block of historic buildings to build another high rise. That wouldn't happen here, at least not right now, because. There would be, you know, debates over the environment and, you know, who owns that property and all these kinds of things. A fascist state, you can understand what the Nazis loved about uh, Germany under Hitler for this reason, because a fascist state can feel really extraordinary unless you fall afoul of a law. And when you do, there's, there's, there's nowhere to go. But China, to me, I was thinking the service here, the progress here, Highway 280, which you drove down today, the, there's been debates my entire life as to what to do about Highway 280 and the traffic there. The Chinese would annihilate, they would, they would make it 10 lanes on both sides by throwing 100,000 workers at it, do it in, uh, finish it in six months, but they would annihilate anything that is in its way and they wouldn't care. That's just that's just who they are. And what we're seeing in the US, I think, and I'm interested in hearing your reaction to this, is that at the highest level, it's not Marxism we're seeing, it is fascism. Absolutely. And they are they are gradually taking in the reins of big tech, of media, of um, of corporations via ESG concentrating them all into the hands of big government to make war against a domestic population and utilize. It's why we are seeing they're all being coached in government and also in, in corporate America to ignore your constituency. I mean, it's the first time I've ever seen anything like this. Where you know the, the term stakeholder? Yes, yeah, stakeholder have you, capitalism. Have, have you yeah. noticed stakeholder uh, very subtly replaced stockholder? Yes. To where suddenly the job of the corporation wasn't to do right by the people who owned it. So no, you don't actually have to own it to have some sort of... Uh, uh, requirement that they work on your behalf. No, you're a stakeholder. Yes. Now. And it then, sounds very high-minded. And then suddenly, you can make anyone a stakeholder for any reason you want. That, that That's the foundation of ESG. Is 100%. It? And that's that's what's what Bud Light was doing. Yep. Is that they were saying, hey, we're, we, are, we are making a moral choice. I mean, it's utterly immoral. But this is what Disney has done. This is what uh, Coca-Cola, all of, of corporate America, it seems, that they have done, and thus they're making war on a domestic population, the conservatives, so that, to go back to what we were talking about in terms of censorship, they don't really care what you think. They don't care whether you like it, whether you even know that Google is censoring you because they figure you'll like us enough that you'll buy our products anyway and you'll keep funding us to make war against you. Yep. My friend David Reboy, who's a, a brilliant uh, foreign policy analyst, it says the left doesn't have foreign enemies, only domestic ones. They look at our actual foreign enemies and say, oh, no, we can work with them. We work with the Chinese. We work a with absolutely. They, they look at Americans who didn't vote for them, and those are the people that need, need to be crushed, and they will use any power they have to do it. And to and, punish them. And this new ESG stuff, it's, it's their loophole around the Constitution. You know, we understand that as the government, we're not allowed to do this to people. So we're just going to get these companies to do it on our behalf. And when that eventually gets nuked by the Supreme Court, which I assume it will in Missouri v. Biden, this big federal censorship case, uh, do you know what they're going to do next? 
They're going to go to foreign governments. They're going to stop relying and going directly to the American third parties to do their dirty work for them. And they're going to go to a foreign, friendly foreign government. And then that foreign government's going to go to the, the American third parties and do it, do it to us good and hard. Well, this is a, uh, a good segue into my final question for you, final topic, and that is Ukraine. I mean, we're, we're using Ukraine as our proxy um, uh, for war against Russia. How do you see Ukraine fitting into the narrative? What, what, what purpose is served by going to war with Russia through Ukraine? What do you think is going on there? I think there's a couple things. In the mind of, of the average leftist, um, it was broken in 2016 when Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton couldn't accept that she lost fair and square. So she and the Democrats and the media had to create this narrative that Russia stole it. Just years prior, when she was Secretary of State, she was trying to do the reset with Russia. She famously gave the, the reset button, button to Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister there. They were all about resetting relations with Russia and having a, a productive relationship with them. You recall in the, in the famous 2012 Obama-Romney debate where Romney said, Russia's the greatest enemy we've had. And, and, and it's China. Yeah, and Obama said the 1980s called, they want their foreign policy back. The policy of the Democrat Party was resetting relations with Russia until the moment that Hillary lost. And then suddenly at that moment, Russia was the biggest enemy we have ever faced on earth. I think that is a huge part of explaining their obsession with using Ukraine as, as a proxy to go to war with Russia. We're going to overthrow Putin. We're, we're going to fight to the last Ukrainian. I think it was a, a literal quote from Lindsey Graham, which I find monstrous. Yeah. Um, so, so you have this weird psychosis, this weird obsession uh, with sticking it to Russia. Um, and then you also have Ukraine as, as, I believe, the money laundering playground of the West. The, the whole Maidan revolution there, which I think was 2014, that was uh, was done by our government. That was mm-hmm. done by Victoria Newland yeah. at the Hillary Clinton uh, and John Kerry State Department. So they've had their fingers in the Ukraine pie for a long and, time. And, and Trump knew there was corruption going a- absolutely. on. Absolutely. It's why they tried to impeach Trump the first time, because he started asking questions about why Ukraine was paying the Bidens millions of dollars. So I, th- I think there's a weird Russia psychosis there. I think there's a lot of need to protect the current regime in Ukraine, because if people actually go in there and find what the U.S. has been doing, it's not going to look good for Bio a lot of people. labs and money laundering. Yep. And, and I, I find the whole thing, I find it so sad you just look at sheer numbers. Ukraine is not going to win that war. No, I agree. They with were you. never they losing. They it. were never going to win that war. And if you go back in time to right after Russia had invaded, they they've had Crimea back for several years. They take the Donbass. They're making a march on Kiev. That gets repelled. That was the moment to strike a peace treaty and move on because it actually for Ukraine would have accomplished a number of important goals. One, you can say you successfully repelled the evil Russian invaders. You told Tsar Putin to go back where he came from. You can stand tall knowing that you defended, uh, you, you defended Kiev. At the same time that you have in the East a primarily ethnic Russian population there. And in fact, it was uh, Russian Ukrainians in the East who to the Western Ukrainians were a constant thumb in the eye because they were the ones voting for who the, the Western Ukrainians would call Russian puppets. Mm-hmm. So you get rid of that voting block there. They go back to Russia. You don't have that massive voting block of Russians voting for Russians to run Ukraine. So you had a twofer there. You can claim victory. You repel the invaders. You lose a lot of these uh, provinces that were causing massive political problems for you. And you come to a settlement. Is there California? <laughs> yeah, you come to a settlement there. But unfortunately uh, for the Ukrainians who are being sent into the meat grinder for this, either Israel or, or either the U.S. or Britain, uh, this was reported in an Israeli paper, um, they told the Ukrainians, you're not suing for peace. You're, you're fighting this thing to the end. We'll give you weapons and all this. We don't care how many die. You're fighting to the end. It is hard for me to look at that situation now and, and, and say, yeah, I think everyone's better off now as, as a result of us having prolonged that war for two years. And this is not to be an apologist for Russia, uh, to be a, an apologist for Putin. It's just realism. It's looking at basic facts on the ground. 
the longer this goes on, the worse it is for everyone. It's worse for Ukrainians. It's worse for Russia. It's worse for the rest of the world because we've seen the economic calamity that's been imposed on us by, by warfare there. Why on earth are we still doing it? Mm -hmm. And we're doing it because a lot of people, whether it's defense contractors or bankers or corrupt uh, politician money launderers, a lot of people are making a lot of money on that war. Yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, in my first book, um, The Grace Effect, which was published a decade before our at least overt involvement in Ukraine, we've been, we've been involved since the, uh, uh, in Ukraine since uh, Clinton and then uh, came straight through, um, you know, Bush's administrations. It's been Democrats and Republicans, yep. as you point out, Lindsey Graham, uh, this kind of thing. But that, that these regimes are equally corrupt um, in their core. I think another factor here is the fact that, um, that Putin isn't a globalist. He is not on board um, with the globalist agenda, but we provoked this war. Uh, uh, Putin had made it very clear, and anybody who knows anything about Russian history knows that Russia has always regarded Ukraine as absolutely vital to their security, both as a breadbasket and access to the Black Sea and yep. thus to the Mediterranean. And he kept warning he kept warning, do not annex to NATO these buffer states. And with a, with a regime in Ukraine that was, that was somewhat Russia-friendly, he was prepared to leave that alone. When we toppled that regime, and we did topple it, then he said, enough is enough. I am in, invading. And I agree with you also that Russia is not the big bad enemy in the sense that you keep hearing guys like Lindsey Graham saying that if we don't stop them there, they're going to invade the whole of you know, of um, Eastern Europe yeah, that, that's and, then, madness. and then roll their tanks, you know, down the Champs-Élysées in Paris. It's absolute madness because I don't think the Russians have the ability to project that kind of power um, at present. But they did make it pretty clear we are prepared to accept the status quo. You keep doing this and we, we feel that we are, we are being threatened and we have to invade. And to me, it's a little bit like, <laughs> although much more serious, is the Cuban Missile Crisis in yeah. reverse. Uh, we were not prepared to allow the Russians to do what they wanted to do and putting missiles and, you know, becoming a hostile state, you know, 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Russia wasn't prepared to have that with NATO um, annexing, uh, adding all these member states and then inviting openly Ukraine to join yep. after Putin had said, so help me you if you do it. We will invade. And it amazes me that all these think tanks, in which billions of dollars have been spent, no one saw it coming. That's yeah, uh, just yeah, astonishing. It, it, all it took was common sense and an understanding we'll of history. We tell you this is happening. It's, it's yeah. going to happen. Yep. And it isn't to defend uh, Putin that I say that. I'm just simply saying common sense tells you that this was going to happen. And I agree with you. I don't think that they can win. You know, I said that was my last question. I have to ask you one more. I personally think that Xi is the most clever statesman or politician on the global stage right now. Evil, but just just as devious as Mao was 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 devilishly clever. And I think that Xi is the same. And to me, it feels like he's this vulture that's just sitting on a limb, provoking both sides, watching, and trying to decide whose bones he wants to pick clean. Yeah, it, it, absolutely, China's our number one enemy. Absolutely. Um, not just militarily, but economically. You look at, at what Nixon did, um, you look at us giving them most favored nation status, which, which I really think was a one of the biggest foreign policy missteps in the last 50 years, because we had convinced ourselves, if we give them a taste of capitalism, we will export our values mm -hmm. there. And it's, that's not what- Yeah, we'll, what, we'll win with the Nintendo and the salad yeah, shooter. And that's yeah. not what's happened. We've actually imported the worst of them. We're, we're having to fight tooth and it's nail. It's happening with, it, with, with the open borders yes. too. The, the idea that the, the open society, you know, uh, Karl Popper's philosophy through George Soros somehow is gonna win out that, that when all these Muslims come into the West that, yeah, we're gonna have to ride out some terrorist attacks, but eventually they're all gonna wanna order their stuff through Amazon, they'll want Netflix, and they're going to want their kids to have Nintendos. It isn't happening. It's not true. We, we imported communism, we imported Marxism, we imported social credit system, and, and now they are so economically intertwined with us. I mean, I, I've 
said it till I'm red in the face. We need an, uh, an American Manhattan Project for making things in America again. We, we actually don't make much of what we need here, uh, either to survive or to, to fight a it's war. Being we need exported. to. Yeah. yeah. We, we import our medicines. We import uh, so much of our fuel, which is madness. We import food. We import so much of our equipment, our computer technology. How on earth can you survive as a society long term when you're dependent upon your enemies for the stuff you need to live? And China has done such a a uh, cunning job of getting us to depend on them for everything economically. I don't know how we would begin to, to unwind uh, our connection to them now. And so I have to say, when I hear people in Washington saber rattling about Taiwan, we got to arm Taiwan, we got to help Taiwan, we'll, we'll fight to the death for Taiwan. Okay, that's all fine and good. But when you won't even extricate us economically from China, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't believe that somehow going to war with them over Taiwan is somehow going to be the thing that fixes everything. You have to show me that you're serious about doing like the nitty gritty day to day that doesn't require tens of thousands of bodies uh, uh, lying dead in the middle of a war. Convince me you can do the little things right. They have no interest in it. And it's fascinating to watch she play our government like an absolute fiddle yep. in it. I, I agree. Do you think it's too late to save America? Ah, oh, that's a theological, spiritual question. Well, see, that was where I was hoping you would go. Yeah, so it's not too late for anything. The God that made us, uh, the God that uh, redeemed us, the God that forgives our sins can do anything. If he can, if he can create everything from nothing, if he can absolve us uh, of our sins through Jesus Christ, he can do anything. So I'm never going to say it's too late for America. I will say, I believe, absent collective... Um, repentance, uh, a collective desire uh, for God to restore us, um, to, to bring us to repentance. I saw on the road driving here this morning uh, one of the church signs. With oh, the I thought black you were going to see a dead possum. No, oh, no, I saw lots of them. <laughs> the, the little church signs that said, Lord, please heal our nation. Mm. And I thought that, that's what we need. Mm. So we can absolutely be restored uh, as a nation, I don't think it comes without us being restored spiritually and returning to our, our roots as a country, which are repentance, undeniably, indisputably Christian. Yes. We, we, our founders made a covenant with God when they came here that we have turned our backs on. And when you turn your back on God, who blessed you immeasurably, uh, what do you expect is going to happen? So I pray that we will come to repentance as a country, acknowledge our wrongdoing, and ask God to bless us again. I think that's our only path to renewal. You know, um, I, I love your answer because I agree wholeheartedly. People will say, it's too late. It's too late. We've reached the tipping point. It's over. I, I wouldn't be doing this if I believed exactly. that. Exactly. I wouldn't be doing this if I believed that. I, I do this because, no, I believe we can win, and I don't believe that theirs is the default um, you know, reasonable position. Uh, and I serve a great God who changed the world with 12. I serve a great God who won great battles with, um, with 300. So I know what he can do with a remnant that who truly believes and who trusts in him and who are invigorated by his spirit and given wisdom. So I very much believe that. I think we need, we need another, we need a third great awakening Amen. is, uh, is what we need in this country. And we need, uh, a people to return to those values because what his I, 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 I find it very interesting uh, I'm trying to remember his name Kase I think is his last name one of the signers aboard the USS Missouri of the, um, uh, the treaty with Japan under uh, MacArthur's supervision there um, aboard that ship he wrote something very beautiful after that. Um, he said that being there on that ship and meeting MacArthur, he said it dawned on him, we were not beaten by um, superior dint of arms, he said, but by a superior moral force, which algebra cannot compute. <laughs> 
So just such a powerful statement. He realized it was America's moral force which had defeated them. And now America has ceded the moral high ground. Um, we have become, in some sense, almost playing into the, uh, the Islamic narrative, we have become the great Satan. I mean, where we think it's okay to lop off the penises of adolescent boys and trans them. And uh, I mean, this is Mengele, you know, kind of stuff. We're annihilating the uh, unborn. We are think nothing of killing um, foreign, uh, foreign innocents. We think nothing of suppressing the rights of domestics. Any of these things um, we're prepared to do. And that has to change. And the only way that can change is if we're tra changed um, and transformed spiritually. Sean, I've had the feeling throughout this entire interview that I've been interviewing myself. So, um, and for that reason, I just love your opinions. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. It's been an honor to be on. And I'll leave you with a verse. You, you, you raise the question, why do we even do it? Because it's so easy to be defeatist. Yes. And because I'm a Christian, because my faith infuses everything I do, I'm constantly reminded in this arena of my favorite verse, which is, it's Hebrews 12, 1, run with perseverance, the race marked out for you. And we all have a different race marked out for ourselves. Uh, you've got a different one. I've got a different one. Everyone watching has a different one. He doesn't tell us to run and win because that's not in our hands. That's in his hands. He tells us to run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. That's all we have to do. I love that. And to that, I'll add Psalm thirty-three, twelve: Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.